Okay guys, let's take a look at our next problem. All right, so the problem is saying the rectangular plate shown has a mass of 15 kilograms and is held in position by hinges at A and B and cable EF. Assuming that the hinge at B does not exert any axial thrust, determine the tension in the cable and the reaction at B. So this is definitely um, an exam type problem where they're giving you a three-dimensional shape with a whole bunch of forces on it and asking you to calculate something or the other. So this being said, um, let's quickly reiterate our strategy for solving these types of problems. Um, you guys have these obviously in your notes, but let's quickly go over them. The first step, of course, is to apply to make a free body diagram and resolve any force that we don't like um, into its components. And then you have all of these at your disposal. You can take a look at, you know, sigma fx, sigma fy, sigma fz and make them equal to zero, of course, because this is a statics course. Then you can ask yourself, OK, can I take the moment about some quote unquote point or the origin and see if that allows me to solve for something? Other options include taking the moment about your usual X or Y or Z axes, seeing if that allows you to calculate something. If that fails, then you should understand that you also have the authority to take the moment about the X axis, but not the usual X axis. You're allowed to take that X axis and translate it um, anywhere you want. And you can do that with the Y or the Z. If that also fails, then you have one last out available, which is to calculate the moment about an axis that you create. And remember, we took a look at a problem like that. The only way to do that is to create a matrix where your first row is a unit vector um, about your axis. The second row is a vector from where you're calculating the moment to where the force is being applied. And then, of course, the third one is your force result. The way I want to teach you guys how to do this problem, however, um, once we make our free body diagram, we're going to see that there's going to be a whole bunch of forces um, acting on this object. And we want to develop a strategy where we can solve for um, one unknown using nothing more than one equation, if possible. And that is, um, you know, 90% of the time you can get away with solving for each unknown using just one equation. And this means, what this does require though, is being able to visualize in 3D what is going on and which, uh, which forces are actually creating moments about an axis. Remember, we spoke about this last time. Um, a force does not create a moment about an axis if A, it passes, its line of action passes through the axis of rotation, or B, if the force is in fact parallel um, to the axis of rotation. So what I'm trying to say over here, let's say I have my calculator and I want it to spin this way. Now, so there's an axis of rotation going there. Now, if I was to push it with a force this way, where the line of action of my force is going through the axis of rotation, it is not going to cause it to spin, rather it'll cause it to move this way. But if I take this force and move it just a little bit up or a little bit down, then it'll actually cause it to spin. So if the line of action of my force goes through the axis of rotation, it does not generate a moment. Furthermore, if the force is parallel to the axis of rotation, obviously if I push this way, it is not going to cause the object to spin. So the moral of the story there is that a force dies, does not create a moment if it goes through the axis or if it's parallel to the axis. Understanding these, let's take a look at how we can apply these concepts to the problem that we have um, at hand. Let's blow this guy up a little bit so we can clearly see what's going on. So first things first, we want to build a free body diagram for this shape. So let's see what's going on. First of all, there's a cord here, so clearly there's going to be a tension going there from E to F. They told us that this object has a weight, so right at the middle of this guy, there's going to be, you know, the weight going down. I'll just draw it like that. Now I have a couple of hinges over here, and you just have to straight up memorize the reactions at supports, right? So for a ball at socket joint, a hinge, a pin, a roller, a fixed support, these are things you should just know. For example, at a hinge, we know 
that there's going to be, in this particular case, um, three forces. And of course, you can pick the direction of these forces to be whichever way you want. Similarly, at B, there's going to be three forces as well, except for the fact that they are saying in the problem that the hinge at B does not exert any axial thrust. And in plain English, that means that there will not be a force along its axis. So this is what our free body diagram is going to look like. If we label our forces, this will be the weight. We'll call this guy BY and this guy BZ. And similarly here, we have AZ and AX and AY. So that's our first step, building the free body diagram. And then if there is any force that we don't like, we want to break it down into its components. And if we realize that, we will see very quickly that this guy is no good. We don't like him at all. So I'm going to take this force and I'm going to break it down into its components. Now, a lot of you guys do this in, um, you know, in a way that takes a little bit too long for my liking, right? What do you guys do? You find a unit vector from here to here. In order to do that, you find the coordinates of this point and this point, and then you subtract them, and then you divide by the magnitude. We're not going to do that anymore, okay? Because let's imagine you have 10 of these. That's going to take you all day to solve. Understand that the general template for breaking down, um, well, this is the tension. It looks like this. So our tension as a vector is going to be t times some unit vector. Uh, let's give ourselves a little bit more space. Some unit vector and divided by the magnitude of that unit vector. So square root of this squared plus this squared plus this squared. Now this is the template. Now watch how I fill this guy out. All I'm going to do, guys, is I'm going to walk like a robot from E to F. So only in straight line segments. Pick any path that you desire and just simply walk from E to F. So let's say we go this way first, then we go that way next, and then we go up. That's it, that takes us from E to F. Now, if you wish to go around all that way, you'll get the same answer. So this being said, what did I do? I walked 80 millimeters along this axis, which is the positive X axis. So 80 millimeters, or 0 0.08 along the X. What did I do next? I walked 200 millimeters backwards in the z-axis. So in the z, it's going to be negative 0.2. And finally, I went up 250 milliliters, uh, millimeters, so 0.25. And that's it. All of you guys know how to calculate the magnitude. I'm simply going to square 0 0.8 squared plus 0.25 squared plus 0.2 squared and I'll take the square root of my answer right away. If I do that, I get 0.33. So hopefully you guys see how quick that was. And so now I can rewrite this as 0 0.08 divided by 0.33, or let's just say 8 over 33t, and then 0.25 divided by 0.33, or 25 over 33t. And lastly, negative 20 t over 33. There you have it. Your force has been broken down. And instead of looking at it this way, I'm going to completely ignore that guy and replace him with these guys. We know it has a positive x component, so there's going to be a component here. It has a positive y component, so a component straight up, and a component in the negative z direction. Now, since this is making my weight. Let's just move the weight a little bit so that the diagram becomes clear for everyone. This weight, of course, is at the middle of the rectangular plate. So this being said now, um, we are ready to solve this problem. The very first thing we're going to ask ourselves is, can I do sigma fx or sigma fy or sigma Z, fz equal to zero? Will that allow me to solve for something? And very quickly, you'll discover that the answer to that is no, because in the x direction, there are one, and then there is this guy, tx, two unknowns. In the y, there's too many unknowns. In the z, there's too many unknowns, so obviously that's a fail. 
Next, we're going to say, okay, can I take the moment about a point? But I want to stay away from that because that automatically requires that I set up and solve a matrix for every force present. That's going to be too long. So now we're going to say, okay, what about taking the moment about an axis, the X axis or the Y or the Z? So let's entertain the X axis first. So if we take a look at the moment about the X axis, this axis right here, we're going to discover that all of the reactions at A and B go away because their lines of actions pass through that axis. Furthermore, Tx is going to go away because he is parallel to the axis. Furthermore, Tz is going to go away because he goes right through the axis. If I was to extend that line of action, it would pass right through. So the only forces that kind of survive is the Y component of your tension as well as the weight. The weight is a known quantity, right? We know that this rectangular plate is 15, weighs 15 kilograms. So the weight, of course, is just 15 times 9.8. We know that value. So 15 times 9.8 is 147 newtons. So the only unknown left, guys, is T. We're going to take the moment about the x-axis and right away solve for T. So let's see what that gives us. So we're going to take the counterclockwise positive sum of moments about the x-axis and make that equal to 0. We know that the only two forces that kind of survive here are our weight, which is 147, and the y component of our tension, which is 25t over 33. And this is going to equal to 0. Now, in order to calculate moments, remember, we have to multiply the force by a perpendicular distance. So if we ask ourselves, what is the distance between the weight and the x-axis, you're going to realize it's half of this value, or just 0.1 meters. What is the distance between the y component of my tension and the x-axis, the perpendicular distance? And most of you guys can see it's 0.2. And the last thing to check is which one is positive and which one is negative. Well, if the x-axis is here and I pull down on it this way, you can see that it wants to rotate counterclockwise. Therefore, the weight is positive. Now, if the x-axis is here and I push up here, the pen wants to spin in a clockwise fashion. Our second term is negative. And this is going to allow us, guys, to solve for t. So let's just do the math very quickly. 147 times 0.1 times 33 divided by 25 times 0.2 and that's going to give us an answer of 97.02 newtons and now we know our tension so that answer is the first part of the question and you can apply a similar strategy here guys to solve for every single well we know these every one of the remaining unknowns one line to get the answer, one equation to get the answer. So the second piece is asking us to calculate the reaction at B. So if we want to calculate the reaction simply at B, that amounts to trying to figure out where BY and BZ are. So to calculate um, either one, it really doesn't matter, you go through the process again. You say, okay, sigma FX, FY, and FZ, does that allow me to solve for anything? Well, sigma Fy, no good. Sigma Fz, no good. But sigma Fx, we could do. If we apply sigma Fx, what are our unknowns? Well, there's Tx and Ax, right? Now, T, we now know. We know what Tx is. So if I add this and this, they should equal to 0. That's going to allow you to solve for Ax. We're not going to do that, though, because that's not what the question is asking. What the question is asking is for us to find By and Bz, Let's take a look at how we can do that now. So we did the moment about the x-axis. Um, let's take a look at the moment about the y-axis. If I was to take the moment about the y-axis right here, az and bz would both create moments, and therefore that would be a fail. There's too many unknowns. If we take the moment about the z-axis, then you should see that ay and by would both create moments, and that's a fail. So now what else could you do? Remember I told you guys a little bit earlier that you are allowed to take your x and your y and your z axes and translate them wherever you want. 
And that's precisely what we're going to do here, guys. What I'm going to do in my, for the next one is I am going to calculate the moment about the y-axis, but not this one. I'm going to let my y-axis pass through A. I'm going to calculate the moment about that axis. Let's take a look at what that would do. If I let calculate the moment about this axis, I hope you guys agree that all three of these guys die. They go through. Furthermore, by dies because it is parallel to the axis. Taking the moment here is going to allow you to solve for bz. Let's take a look at how we could get that done. So let's get some space over here. Um, actually, we could probably just shrink this. Whoops. Let's try that again. So let's put this aside for the time being and take a look at the moment. So we're going to calculate the counterclockwise positive moment about the y-axis through A. And we're going to make that equal to zero, obviously. So if we do this, what survives? Well, first of all, the weight survives. Uh, no, the weight goes away because it is parallel. Ty goes away. Tz and Tx both create moments, so let's start there. So Tz is going to create a moment about this point, and Tz is equal to this value here. I will not take the negative sign because that is going to be incorporated once I check the direction. So Tz would be 20 times T, which we discovered was 97.2. Oops. 0 0.02 rather, divided by 33. So that is the first one I am considering. And its distance to the y-axis at A is this much. So it's 300 minus the 40 um, over here. So it's 260 millimeters or 0.26. Now I could have written 260 and left it in millimeters because it's equal to 0. It wouldn't have made a difference. But let's stay with standard units. The next one is Tx. So Tx is this guy here. So 8 times 97.02 divided by 33. And its distance to AY is this much. It is 200 or 0.2 meters. And lastly, we have BZ to A. Now BZ, we don't know. Its distance to A would be how much? It's this much. The whole distance is 380, from which you're going to subtract 40 from both ends. Right? There's 40 millimeters here and 40 here. So 380 minus 40 leaves you with 300. So the distance there is 0.3. I'm going to set this equal to 0. Let's quickly make sure we understand the directions of each one. So if I take Tz here, right? if this is the y-axis and I'm pushing here, you can see that it is spinning counterclockwise, so he is positive. Tx, once again, this is my y-axis, I'm pushing here. Once again, it wants to rotate in a counterclockwise fashion, so positive. And then Bz is going to make it rotate clockwise, so this would be a negative value, and we can quickly solve for, for Bz and get that answer. So let me give you this one, and then I'm going to give you guys a couple of minutes to work on the problem and solve for By. It's not going to take you guys long to discover that in order to get that done, you'll take the moment about the z-axis passing through A. So let's take a look at the answer here. So it's 20 times 97.02 times 0.26 divided by 33 plus 8 times 97.02 uh, times 0.2 divided by 33 and all of that divided by 0.3. So I get a final answer of 66.64 newtons if I have typed this in to my calculator correctly. If I haven't, one of you guys can do it and just let me know what the right answer is. But really what I care about is you guys understanding how I came up with that equation. So hopefully this was helpful. Work on solving the next problem and we'll take a look at it together.